This talk is about a climate pattern that we call the North Pacific Gyre Oscillation, which helps link ocean climate and ecosystem changes. This work is in collaboration with Niklas Schneider and others such as Peter Franks that are here in the audience. Now some motivation. In the North Pacific, this is a map of sea surface temperature anomaly during the positive phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, or PDO. This uh, PDO pattern has been used uh, widely to characterize both the physical and biological state of the North Pacific. However, there are key oceanic uh, physical and biological variables, such as salinity, nutrients, and chlorophyll, which are not very correlated with the PDO. An example of these long-term time series uh, comes from observations at Line P in the Gulf of Alaska from 1950 to present, and from the California Current in the Kotkofi Observational Program, also from 1950 to present. So let's look at these observations. So here are the California current observations for time series of sea surface temperature, sea surface salinity, uh, nutrients at 150 meters, and chlorophyll integrated in the upper ocean. And here's the equivalent for the Gulf of Alaska. As I said, if we compare the sea surface temperatures with the PDO index, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, we find that they are very well correlated, and that's in fact uh, uh, by construction since the PDO is defined as the dominant mode, EOF1, of sea surface temperature. However, if we compare the PDO index with these other time series, we find that there is uh, almost no correlation. So the question then raises is what dynamics control salinity and nutrient welling and, cl and chlorophyll? Well, um, are there other climate modes that can be important in this region? When, uh, there's a paper by Bonnet in 2003 that talks about the second EOF of sea surface temperature, which he calls the Victoria mode. And, he, and in this paper, this mode is ascribed as becoming more important in explaining sea surface temperature variability, and maybe with some consequences also in ecosystem. Now we looked a little bit more carefully at this, and uh, we find that we can isolate this climate mode better in the sea surface height, in the EOF2 of sea surface height, which represents a uh, dynamically strengthening and weakening of the subtropical and subpolar gyres. So in some sense, this particular EOF, or climate mode in sea surface height, uh, is an index of the strength of the gyroskill circulation. As such, I'm going to refer to this as the North Pacific Gyre Oscillation, or NPGO. If we look at the time series of this climate mode, or the NPGO index, and we compare it to the California current data, we find that indeed this uh, index captures extremely well these low frequency fluctuations of salinity, uh, nutrients, and chlorophyll. And if we also compare it to the Gulf of Alaska data, uh, we find that in fact it uh, captures also very well the Gulf of Alaska. Um, so that means in fact that uh, the Gulf of Alaska uh, salinity and nutrient time series are actually in phase uh, with the ones in the California current, uh, something that uh, has never been observed or reported before. So to summarize then, uh, the NPGO uh, controls unexplained, previously unexplained variations of salinity, nutrient upwelling, and chlorophyll A recorded in the California current and Gulf of Alaska. But now let's go and dig a little bit more into the dynamics and let's ask the question of how does the NPGO affect locally the Southern California current. Well, the California current is an upwelling system and so the primary candidate uh, to explain the dynamics is changes in upwelling. Now if we take a time series, in fact, of the to begin testing this hypothesis, we can take a time series of the upwelling favorable winds along the California current, and if we plot them over the salinity, we find here in orange uh, that the, the alongshore wind stress in the CCS are correlated very highly with the salinity, indeed suggesting that upwelling, changes in the upwelling are the driver for these low frequency fluctuations of salinity, nutrient, etc. Uh, we also tested further this upwelling hypothesis uh, by taking an ocean model forced with the ANSEP reanalysis uh, and driven um, an ocean model that was used to drive a simple ecosystem model that has four components, nitrogen, phytoplankton, zooplankton, and detritus, or an NPZD model. Now, this, this, the beauty of this model is this model is, is very simple in its dynamics, uh, basically changes in the nutrient flux affect you know changes in in phytoplankton and zooplankton so this model only captures a bottom-up control in the ecosystem so if we perform this model simulation we compare the output of the nitrogen and the chlorophyll against the Kalkofi data we find that this very simple model in fact has incredibly high skill in capturing the variations in both the nutrient upwelling and the chlorophyll therefore suggesting that in fact this is a very uh, basic mechanism of uh, of uh, of bottom-up control from the physics to the lower trophic levels. In fact, uh, 
there's also something more interesting, which is a recent paper by Racineski and Checkley, who showed that these changes in upwelling, uh, in fact, can drive uh, changes also in the fish, which would make a link, uh, you know, of the of the NPGO all the way into the into the fish. Now, but having said that these winds are important, let's ask another question: How are coastal upwelling winds in the CCS linked to large-scale forcing? It turns out that there are two dominant patterns of atmospheric variability in the Northeast Pacific. Um, and these are very evident in sea level pressure anomaly and wind stress anomaly. The first pattern is associated with uh, changes in the Aleutian low. So now you have here low sea level pressure and this uh, counterclockwise circulation in the wind stress field. In fact, these changes in the Aleutian low are in fact the forcing pattern of the PDO and have been reported in various papers in the literature. Now there's a second dominant pattern which instead is associated with the dipole structure in the sea level pressure and with intensification of the winds in the proximity of the North Pacific Current. In fact, these winds intensify the gyroscale circulation by intensifying the North Pacific Current and these winds forcing correspond, in fact, to the forcing pattern of the NPGO, the North Pacific Gyro Oscillation. Now this particular pattern in the wind stress is actually distinct uh, from, uh, from the variability um, of this pattern in the Aleutian Low, although often in the literature uh, you know, associated with some of the climate shifts, these two patterns are kind of used uh, without distinction. Now this particular pattern here, the NPGO forcing pattern, is actually not new and has been firstly described in the literature uh, by Walker and Bliss in 1932 and referred to as the North Pacific Oscillation. So in some sense, the NPGO is the oceanic expression of the North Pacific Oscillation. Now, there's a study uh, conducted uh, that is being prepared by Chuck Di Lorenzo, Snyder and Cummins that investigate the forcing of low frequency variability in the Northeast Pacific, in particular how these uh, atmospheric patterns drive uh, the upper ocean response. And what they find is that associated with this uh, first pattern, the Aleutian Low, Dri uh, this pattern basically drives the EOF1 of sea surface height and sea surface temperature, which is consistent with, with, with the fact that this is the PDO forcing pattern. However, this atmospheric pattern doesn't drive the dominant mode of variability in the salinity and nutrients. In fact, it only appears as EOF2. Now, if we did the same analysis for the for the North Pacific Oscillation pattern, we find that uh, it drives the second EOF of sea surface height, which is what we define the NPGO, the second EOF of sea surface temperature, which is what has been defined by Bond as the Victoria mode, and the f uh, it drives also the first mode of variability in both the salinity and nutrients. So this particular forcing pattern uh, associated with the NPGO is the dominant mode of variability for the salinity and nutrients. Now let's go back to the question of how these atmospheric forcing drive coastal upwelling in the CCS. Well, we note immediately that if we look at these patterns, they have different projections on the coastal upwelling. In particular, uh, the changes in the Aleutian Low have a very strong projection here in the northern coast, whether changes in the North Pacific Oscillation have, in, in relative to the, to the first pattern, a stronger projection in the southern cell. So as an hypothesis, we can uh, we can suggest that in the northern component of the of the upwelling system, uh, the variability of upwelling will will more look like a PDO type. Whether in the in the southern cell, the variability of the upwelling will more follow the NPGO index. Now, to test this hypothesis, um, uh, Chuck et al. Um, in 2007 performed a, a, a high resolution inverse ocean model um, study uh, to investigate decadal fluctuations in the depth of the upwelling cell. Using a passive tracer, they come up with an index of, uh, that they define as the coastal upwelling depth index, which basically is, a, tracks, uh, is an index of the depth of the upwelling cell. Uh, now, if we look at this index in this uh, red box here, um, north of 38 north up to 48 north, and we compare to the PDO, in fact, uh, this uh, upwelling depth index tracks very well the PDO. If we did a similar analysis now for the southern cell, we find that the index uh, follows much better the NPGO. So that means that um, that the cadal variations of the CCS upwelling cells are not uniform along the coast and reflect different forcing controls. Uh, specifically in the southern, in the northern component, they are more controlled by changes in the Aleutian low and so they follow a PDO type variability. Whether in the southern cell, they, f they are more controlled by the North Pacific oscillation and therefore have more of an NPGO type variability. But let's focus a little bit more 
on this uh, on this atmospheric forcing pattern. And um, let's remind ourselves then this is the atmospheric forcing pattern that drives the NPGL. And let's now ask the question of what about the oceanic adjustment to the NPGL wind force? In other words, uh, once you have an anomalous pattern like this, uh, here in the Northeast Pacific you drive an immediate NPGL response, but you also excite oceanic variability such as Rossby waves which propagate to the west. And in fact, um, we have that following this anomaly in this pattern, you have a westward propagation of these Rossby waves, and when these hit the kurosho washo region, or the western boundary, they also trigger variability in the, in the, in the western boundary. In fact, uh, there's a study uh, that's been published by Taguchi et al. 2007, uh, where they, they look at the strength, the decadal modulation in the strength of the kurosho washo current in this region, and uh, if we look at the, uh, the time series of these uh, decadal modulations in the kurosho uh current and we, and we plot them over the NPGO index, we find that indeed these are very highly correlated, um, uh, 0.51. Now the, there's a lag involved of about 2.5 years, which is associated with the fact that the anomalies, the Rossby wave, have to propagate to the west. So this is actually an interesting result and says that the NPGO leads decadal variations in the strength of the Kurosho and therefore connects you know, the California and Japan uh, systems, if you like, which could have important implication for um, you know, coherent variations in the ecosystem across these two um, uh, uh, boundary systems. So that actually raises a question of whether uh, the NPGO is actually a global scale pattern. And let's ask this question, is the NPGO a global scale pattern? Well, to to start addressing this question, we, we can take the NPGO index and do a correlation of the NPGO index with global uh, satellite sea surface height data. And what we find is we find a large scale pattern. Uh, there's a strong intensification here, this dipole structure, which is associated with an intensification of the gyroscope circulation in the Northeast Pacific. However, you find that the structure extends all the way to the tropics, beyond the tropic in the Southern Ocean, with also some connections in the Indian Ocean. Now we can do a similar correlation analysis with the sea global sea surface temperature data, which is extends longer in time. And here we also find a nice structure uh, that is, has a global scale structure, at least in the Pacific. We also note that in the sea surface temperature, uh, there's an equatorially symmetric pattern, uh, which suggests that a uh, couple tropical dynamics are also involved in the, in the in the dynamics of this NPGO, which is kind of interesting because now you start seeing a link between the tropics, the Northeast Pacific, uh, and the western boundary, which is all kind of well tied together. So to summarize, we find that the NPGO controls low frequency variations of salinity, nutrient upwelling, and chlorophyll A in the Northeast Pacific, which you know have been collected for many, many years and remained unexplained until now. Um, in the California current system, the atmospheric forcing of the NPGO drives the upwelling cells south of 38 north, while the PDO drives of the northern cell. So these are symmetric, asymmetric response in the, along the coast. We also find that the NPGO leads decadal variations in the kurosho Ashra extension, uh, potentially uh, giving some predictive skill and also some uh, mechanism to link ecosystems across these regions. These findings also suggest new hypotheses. In particular is that the NPGO is a global scale pattern, which may help explain coherent decadal variations in Pacific ecosystem both in the past and also in the future. And from a physical point of view, the NPGO link with the tropics, which is very evident in the sea surface temperature, may lead to a more unified theory of Pacific decadal variability, which I did not have time to discuss, but this is all. Thank you.